Um, good morning. My name is Gabriella Coos. Um, I sit on the board of directors of the Global Digital Asset and Cryptocurrency Association. For those who may be unaware, we are a global, voluntary, self-regulatory A association that represents the digital asset industry and that supports stewardship in the public interest. Um, today I'll be speaking about uh, global adoption of digital assets around the world. Um, and I will highlight a number of different use cases and also explore some of the challenges that we've seen as well as opportunities in order to elaborate and to continue to allow this very important technology to flourish. Before I go into my presentation though, I just wanted to take a moment to thank the Government Blockchain Association for putting on this very important event and also to thank my co-presenter today, Mary Beth Buchanan, uh, who will be sharing the stage with me as part of a fireside chat. So before we kind of begin, I wanted to level set just a bit and talk about what is a digital asset. So we're looking at a digital currency or virtual currency. We're talking about um, the use of cryptography, the utilization of a distributed ledger technology or DLT. Um, this could be in the form of a currency, commodity, a security, or a derivative or a commodity or security. To kind of paint the landscape of what we see. At this point, we're looking at a significant and growing amount um, of adoption and implementation worldwide. Um, at this point, there are very few countries around the world that are not in the process of adopting and utilizing digital assets by their citizens. Um, if you're looking at the total market cap here, you're looking at a few trillion dollars, and this is consistently growing. You're also looking at a global landscape. Um, as I mentioned, there's very few countries where we have not seen the development or elaboration of the digital assets. And generally speaking, the United States, Ukraine, Venezuela, um, and other countries are leading in this space. And this is something to be encouraged and to allow for further development of the space. The last piece that is important, and I think especially from a policy perspective, is the role that digital assets have with regards to being a job creator. So what you're seeing is that in this space, these industries are growing at a time when globally, we're seeing in a post-pandemic world, the need for job creation and economic opportunity. And I'm going to touch on this much further when we talk about why we're seeing such an interest and embrace amongst emerging and developing countries. So around the world, you're going to see different utilizations or um, rationales for the elaboration of adoption um, of digital assets. And that relates to some of the needs that you see. Here in the United States, where we have deposit insurance, where we have a relatively stable um, currency that is not hyperinflationary, you may not see as much of a rapid adoption and implementation as you are seeing in countries where there is excessive political influence in the monetary policy, where you have um, extreme situations of insecurity, and where generally speaking, regardless of the volatility that's seen in the digital asset space, that is nothing compared to what is being seen in regards to their specific jurisdictional fiat. Um, you've seen use cases in particular around the remittances that are being um, sent to and from cross-border, the ability for those to be done instantaneously at low cost, and also um, in order to do it any time of day, regardless of location. Um, as someone who's worked abroad, I can tell you that, you know, the distance many times to a Western Union office, the fact that you have to go there in person during business hours is extremely difficult, in addition to the fact that sometimes you can be paying as much as 10% or more on top of the, um, or as a fee, in order to send money into some of these emerging economies. 
And again, that is tempered by the needs and the use cases that you're going to see within these different jurisdictions. But generally around the world, you see a very strong prevalence, especially in emerging economies, for the opportunities that this affords, the ability to use it as a medium of exchange, and the stability relative to some of the fiat currencies that we're seeing in order to be able to maintain that role and function. So at a macro level, I wanted to take a minute and just talk a bit about what we're seeing in the news today. Um, and this is in particular around some of the digital asset bans. And I think it's important to kind of break this down a bit so that we can start to understand what the um, initial rationale is and how some of that, whether it's a ban or just over-regulation, can be extremely detrimental to the industry as well as to that country's ability to grow economically, provide jobs for its people, and to be competitive um, globally in the digital asset space. So what we're seeing is that the pace of evolution in the digital asset space is very, very fast and it is increasingly evolving and, and increasing over time. And so what this means is that in many countries around the world that already suffer from capacity constraints, difficulty attracting, retaining, maintaining expertise in the financial sector, it's very difficult for them to begin to reflect and consider how and in what way they may need to regulate this space. And so what we're seeing is almost a first instinct to push sort of a pause button so that they take a breath, take a beat, and kind of get their um, strategy or their regulatory approach in line. Now, although that may be helpful to the internal regulators, what it is not helpful for is for that economy. Because what that does is reduce the confidence, especially in businesses that are looking to invest there, to grow. And because this is um, a very movable industry, it is therefore interpreted as being perhaps not hospitable to the digital asset space. These jobs and opportunities and businesses then look at this opportunity and say, I'm going to select a different jurisdiction that perhaps has a you know, greater clarity around the legal and regulatory framework where I know that my investment will be protected and my business can grow and develop harmoniously. Um, what you see as well is that this is wildly unpopular, especially in emerging economies that have high levels of a youth demographic in their population. So these are people who are digitally native um, and generally are embracing and interested in accepting you know, Bitcoin or digital assets more broadly. Um, and so this is an opportunity um, for you know, being able to elaborate this space for the change in the demographic, but also um, it's seen as potentially negatively from a political perspective. So what is the result? Well, many times um, the central banks or regulators are looking at the fact that they understand that they will be losing opportunities in terms of economic growth and job creation, and so there's usually a bit of a walk back or a roll back. I used to joke that it was almost like a one-two step um, for a while where you would see a ban um, or heavy regulation and then begin to see statements coming out of those regulators that were more embracing of digital assets and blockchain technology. The problem is, as I've already mentioned, the damage has already been done in many cases. Um, some of that national domestic industry has perhaps already gone overseas, and the ability for that environment to really begin to nurture this industry and to reap the benefits of job creation, global positioning, um, have been somewhat diminished. And so, you know, along those lines, one of the things that, um, at least from the side of the Global Digital Asset and Cryptocurrency Association, as well as the Government Blockchain Association that we've been working to do, has really been to work with regulators to understand, expand, and begin to reflect and consider how they will regulate this space so that they are not um, having that knee-jerk reaction, but rather are very intentionally and thoughtfully designing a regulatory approach that helps to embrace this and have a balance between the need for consumer protection as well as the need for innovation and development in this space. 
So generally speaking, what are some of the thoughts that we're seeing on regulation? The first piece is that it is evolving. Um, just as the underlying technology is evolving, so are the regulators. They're building capacity, they're working to try and understand how to strike this balance between consumer protection and innovation and economic growth and job creation. And so, you know, again, everyone all around the world is grappling with the emergence of this technology and what it means for their financial sectors. Um, so we've seen many different approaches. Some of that you'll see, you know, from a philosophical perspective is influenced by the nature of the relationship of the citizen to the government, so that social contract that exists. But also some of it is tempered by some of the cultural dimensions, um, as well as some of the nuances of how their regulatory system is designed. So for example, in a unified regulator, many times you'll see a dual mandate that naturally balances the need for consumer protection with the need for innovation and development. In other countries or jurisdictions where it is a more disparate or dislocated regulatory structure, you may see competing interests or a hyper focus on one piece of that equation. Um, what we've also seen is that typically in the first instance, but very soon after, in particular amongst those countries that are looking to position themselves as global um, centers of excellence in the financial sector, that they'll try initially to try and shoehorn this into some of the existing regulation. Um, but then over time, and what we're seeing increasingly, is an understanding that there needs to be a more sophisticated approach to this that takes into consideration some of the unique aspects of this technology and of the digital asset class. We still, though, are seeing um, a very strong focus um, on national borders and engaging in regulation from a very national focus. And obviously for this asset class, the ability for it to transcend borders so easily necessitates a certain degree of harmony between and amongst different jurisdictions in order to allow for and create almost a runway for the digital asset industry to take off and to be able to elaborate itself in countries all around the world. We still though, again, it's improving and I think over time, Increasingly, I would put some of the timelines on this on the next, I'd say, two to three years at a minimum. Um, but you're seeing this desire amongst um, legislators and regulators around the world to try and reduce some of the complexity or ambiguity um, in the legal and regulatory frameworks in order to enable the development of this. And it goes very much to a very strong recognition amongst government leadership in these countries that those countries who invest subsidize, incentivize, and support the development of the digital asset industry will be those countries that will emerge as leaders in the global digital future. And so this is something that, you know, it's, it's not a closely held secret. It's very openly recognized. And in fact, in many of the conversations that we have with either government counterparts or private sector counterparts, there's a recognition and a desire to attract digital asset businesses in order to ensure that they will be able to lead and continue um, some of that positioning with regards to financial centers of excellence. What the Global Digital Asset and Cryptocurrency Association believes is that one of the best ways um, in order to recognize some of the need to be highly responsive to a rapidly evolving industry, in order to ensure some of that global harmonization around the world, which will allow uh, digital asset businesses to grow and expand into ever-increasing markets, um, as well as to improve some of the clarity and reduce some of the costs associated with operating in relatively complex or ambiguous legal environments, um, that self-regulation offers an opportunity. So private sector-led, whether voluntary or not, um, allows for there to be a nearness to the underlying industry that will be able to act in harmony to create regulations or to create some of the standards and best practices around um, the development of this industry. So as to be able to gently allow for growth that does balance that need for consumer protection as well as innovation and leadership. 
We also see this as an important role in helping to develop the micro, small, and medium enterprises. These are engines of growth in many countries around the world. And it's important to recognize that these are job creators and are producing between 80 to 90 percent of jobs um, globally. And so in order to help develop greater innovation in this industry, as well as to contribute to some of those economic outcomes that we'd like to see in countries around the world, being able to provide clarity allows for those MSME businesses to grow and develop, thereby contributing to job creation and economic opportunity. And with that, um, I'd like to invite my friend and colleague, Mary Beth Buchanan, up to the stage um, to introduce herself and to join me in a quick fireside chat. Um, at times, I think it's beneficial to hear a little bit of back and forth and also to have a chance for a bit of a live component um, to some of the educational provision today. Thank you. Well, Mary Beth, it's a pleasure to have you here today. I just wanted to give you a moment to introduce yourself um, and to give us a little bit of a background about your role at Merkel Science. Thank you, Gabby. Um, I began my career uh, with the U.S. Justice Department, so I spent 21 years there, uh, most recently as the presidentially appointed United States Attorney in Western Pennsylvania. I had way too many roles also in the <laughs> Justice Department to to mention because we'd be here for a long time. Um, after leaving the Justice Department, um, I spent two years with the United Nations helping them to perform their first ethics and reputational risk assessment for peacekeeping and special political operations around the world. I then joined um, a law firm, international firm in New York City, and, and there it's when I began to represent uh, digital asset exchanges and coin developers, and this was in 2013. Um, from there, I went to become the general counsel at two digital asset exchanges, Crack and, and Bitstamp. And now I'm the president of Merkle Science Americas. Merkle Science is a blockchain analytics company, and we help um, cryptocurrency companies, financial services, and law enforcement uh, to automate compliance solutions and to be able to track um, digital currency across multiple blockchains. Uh, I forgot to mention, I'm a board member of the Cardano Foundation. Important thing to mention. <laughs> um, well, thank you for that. I wanted to talk with you a little bit about your new role at Merkle Science. Um, we've talked a lot about some of the global implications, um, looking at adoption of digital assets and opportunities and challenges around the world. Can you speak to us a little bit about what you see here in the United States in this respect? Sure. So, um, you know, we've been talking about these questions um, about how to regulate the cryptocurrency industry for years. I remember being on a panel six years ago uh, when nobody on the panel or in the audience could agree what a digital asset is. You know, is it a security? Is it a commodity? Is it property? Is it taxable? And there were some lively debates. Since that time, I think that the the SEC and the CFTC, you know, have tried to stake out some positions um, about which assets are closer to, uh, you know, being commodities or, or securities. And of course, that all comes down to the nature and characteristics uh, of the asset. But, but it's not enough. And, and since that time, organizations like the GBA and others have stepped up and tried to work with, with government agencies to try to refine these regulations. Uh, an organization in 2019 formed the uh, Crypto Rating Council, which was a group of industry leaders that tried to come up with a framework that started with the Howey test and built upon it with the um, guidance that's been issued by the SEC, and to develop a rating system from zero, which would be a commodity, to five, and this changed in increments of 0.25. And, and I think that that's probably one of the best frameworks out there right now, um, but the government agencies have not formally adopted it. We've also seen organizations like GBA um, to work with, uh, work with legislators to, to try to help them with issues from taxonomy to taxation uh, and to work with uh, the, the government to develop 
technical solutions that will work to help um, uh, comply with, with the travel rule. So that's probably one of the latest uh, spaces in which we've seen that. But here in the U.S., it's hard because we have so many different agencies that we have to go to in so many different places to educate. Whereas in other countries around the world, you know, they've developed comprehensive regulatory frameworks. So from, you know, Japan to Abu Dhabi to Singapore, Switzerland, um, Germany, you know, the, the, uh, the, the frameworks are really consolidated and you know which, which agency to go to. So that, I think, is the, the big difference that we're still seeing in the U.S. today. No, that's a very fair point, and it's interesting to note that um, Switzerland and Japan have also adopted a self-regulatory model in addition to that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, just about what we see as perhaps an increasing interest in compliance, um, and just to focus a little bit on what you see as some of the broader trends, especially as firms in the digital asset space seek to enhance their compliance function, um, increase focus on this space. If you could share just a little bit in that area. Sure. So in, in the earlier days, you know, people were amazed that you could actually track digital assets. And, and there was this perception that this was somehow dangerous because it couldn't be tracked. Well, what's more dangerous is the U.S. dollar, which can't really be tracked. So the companies like Merkle Science and others in the space have been developing automated solutions. And these solutions, as I mentioned earlier, can help uh, law enforcement to follow digital assets across blockchains to see where it's gone, where it's been. Um, there are also solutions that help uh, cryptocurrency companies and financial institutions to uh, know about who they're doing business with and also helps these companies to automate their compliance solutions because clearly you cannot throw enough bodies at the compliance issue in the cryptocurrency space. So being able to automate these systems is really helping companies to improve their compliance. And regulators are expecting it. And so I think seeing that this technology is available is um, you know, going a long way, I think, to show regulators that this is not the Wild West. Uh, we, we, know we can have compliance in the cryptocurrency space. And at, and at Merkle, shameless plug, uh, we do a little bit um, that's above and beyond where we try to apply uh, behavioral analytics to look for um, behavioral anomalies to detect illicit activity before it happens. Excellent. And I think you touched very well on my next question, which was going to focus on this idea of stewardship of the industry. And so when we talk about the concept of responsible innovation, we hear that word a lot mentioned, you know, hashtag responsible innovation. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what you see it um, and what the meaning is for you as well as, you know, what at Merkle Science you may be doing in order to advance this area? Sure. So um, in, in, the, in the earlier days, um, the, the concept of, cooperating and collaborating and sharing information didn't exist to the extent that, that it does today. I remember speaking to some of my early clients in 2013, asking them if they were familiar with organizations like the Ethics and Compliance Officers Association that work to share best practices. And they, they looked at me like I had, you know, three heads and said that uh, they, they were not familiar with it. Um, and even if they were, they wouldn't um, collaborate because the industry is just too competitive. But that has completely changed. I, I think now many companies, uh, you know, in this space do share information. They do want to develop best practices. And one of the ways uh, in which we've definitely seen this more than anywhere, it, more than any other uh, issue is with the travel rule. So, you know, this travel rule has been around for a long time and companies have gone through their, um, their IRS and their FinCEN exams and gotten their, you know, check mark for not complying with the travel rule. And that's because there was no way to comply with the travel rule. And so what we have seen um, over the last two years at least with the Department of Treasury has taken a step back and allowed the industry to come together and try to develop some solutions, not just one solution, but multiple solutions 
that might work for companies globally uh, to be able to comply with the Travel Act, travel rule. So, so I do think that that is probably one of the best examples uh, that we've seen. And it also shows that um, the governments are recognizing that the industry wants to play a role in shaping regulations and, and in shaping how uh, we can comply with those regulations. So we, we're, we're, we want clear regulation, but we want to have a voice in shaping that regulation. Excellent. Um, and you've already kind of, uh, you know, mentioned the cooperation that's needed and the engagement, but I think it's um, important just to highlight the need for there to be the public and private sector cooperation because we are dealing with an emerging industry and there's almost a public interest ethos that needs to accompany efforts to educate and to share knowledge and understanding on this so that our policymakers can be better informed. Um, Along those lines, what suggestions do you have perhaps for both the industry as well as for our counterparts in regulators and government agencies? How can we work together better or how can we enhance this public-private engagement? You know, I think probably one of the most recent examples of this um, would be the Department of Treasury's willingness to share information uh, with the industry about what they learned uh, through some of the recent ransomware attacks. So the um, Treasury held a multiple day conference that brought together uh, digital asset exchanges, government agencies, all of the federal criminal investigative bodies, and some of the analytics companies like Merkle. And we talked about um, what was learned uh, through some of those attacks. And, and, and they shared information, which is usually the information sharing goes the other way. So this was good to see that the government was willing to share some information in this instance. So I hope that we continue to see this type of coordination. And um, other examples would be the, the FinCEN um, Innovation Hours, the SEC's FinHub, um, other initiatives that uh, certain state state and federal regulators have been engaging in. Well, excellent. Um, and we have time, I think, for just one more question. And so for that, I'd love to draw out some of the amazing experience that you've had around the world. Um, you know, some of the work that you've done with the UN has taken you to destinations that, as we discussed in the presentation, um, perhaps do not have the easiest monetary policy environments. Um, can you talk a little bit about what some of the social outcomes are or what you see as some of the potential benefits, perhaps both here in the United States as well as around the world, with the evolution and elaboration of digital assets and cryptocurrency? Sure. So during my time uh, with the UN, I went to a lot of um, places in the world that most people don't put on their travel list. Most of them were in, in Africa. I spent a lot of time in the Congo, uh, where there really aren't good roads. So people are driving on hard packed clay and they're sort of clumped together in the back of a pickup truck, you know, to, to get to where they need to get, you know, across the thousand miles of, of the uh, DRC. There are not the types of technology that we have. You see people walking along roads uh, in Rwanda carrying, you know, crude uh, farming implements on their back, and they're, they're walking miles and miles. And they don't have access to the financial system like we do. Uh, they don't have, there aren't money access uh, machines everywhere. Uh, you, in many places don't take credit cards, and, and so it's, we, we shouldn't uh, take for granted what we have here. Uh, but one of the most exciting projects I've heard about uh, involves Cardano and uh, its partnership with the Ethiopian government to provide digital identity uh, initially to five million people who don't have it. So it's, it's innovation like that uh, that is something that we can foster uh, through this uh, cryptocurrency ecosystem, and I'm really excited uh, to, be, to be part of the Cardano Foundation and to see um, what other great ideas uh, Charles has up his sleeve. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I couldn't agree with you more about especially some of the opportunities that there are for the unbanked or the underbanked. 
Um, you know, we look at countries like El Salvador, which prior to the um, decision to treat Bitcoin like legal tender, we're looking at a percentage of the population in somewhere near 70% who were underbanked. And so, you know, these are almost crisis levels um, for exclusion from the formal uh, financial sector. And I think it may not be a panacea, but it is one opportunity to really extend and to consider how this technology can be used um, in order to help relieve some of these challenges. Yeah, I, I remember <clears throat> on these trips how difficult it was for me to, to um, survive, you know, for, for like a month at a time, to have to figure out how much cash was I going to need in $100 bills that were later than a specific date. I mean, it was even hard to get this from my bank because I have to like call ahead, like I'm going to need like whatever. And then carrying this on your body. Imagine like what a target I felt like in, in, in some of these places riding around, you know, in the UN Jeep. And, and they all know, okay, here's the, here's the lady from New York. She's uh, like, where, where she taped her cash today. And so imagine what it's like, like to, you know, to live in that system. And, and so it's, it's a, just, I, I just can't wait to see what, what new innovation uh, that will be continued to be developed. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Mary Beth, for sharing a little bit of your perspective as well as that of Merkel Sciences. Um, and I would just like to also say that, you know, this has been an exciting and really important opportunity that highlights some of the need for and um, ability to engage both public and private sector to come together to share some of these important stories. So thank you very much. Hi there, uh, Randall Lee Pires with uh, Emirate Inc. So I, I've actually been stuck in a country before without money for two months in South Sudan. They didn't even have one ATM there, right? And then 30% uh, fee was Western Union, right? So I made my budget, but then by the time I got it, I was off by many weeks. Um, and I'm curious your thoughts now that uh, the, the, um, what the impact is of Bitcoin now that Twitter last week can send these remittances and anybody can tip in Bitcoin, that's like 200 million people around the world. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll give my perspective first and then I'll pass it on to Mary Beth. I think, um, you know, one is we haven't yet seen what the full effect of that will be just because it's happened so soon. But I believe that that greater access, that ability to so easily be able to send money, um, will be able to enhance the opportunities for people to transmit funds, as you've mentioned, um, to be able to feed their families, to send their kids to school. And again, you know, it's important to look at these uh, different interventions or opportunities over a period of time. But I think we're just at the beginning of seeing what it could mean for people's livelihoods, their economic well-being, and their social well-being um, for having these types of, you know, innovations or technological opportunities that are afforded them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that it's um, a real game changer to be able to allow people in places that don't normally have access to the financial systems to be able to carry their own, to keep their own assets and, and to not have it taken away from them and to be able to send money around the world quickly, cheaply. Can I say Cardano again? So there's lots of solutions out there um, that will enable people uh, to be able to uh, secure their, their own assets and to share them uh, with their families uh, around the globe. I remember being, again, in, in you know, Congo and trying to buy things and then getting back like a stack of dirty Congolese francs and it's like, what am I going to do with this, <laughs> you know? And so it's, it's more hygienic too. So this is a, uh, an, another reason. COVID friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, and I think it's good just to mention one other piece, which is that there's also a personal safety component of this. For many of the individuals who live in these environments, if they're not putting money into a bank account because they don't have access or ability, that means that they're either carrying that money on their person, which makes them a target, similar to how you felt <laughs> with your different story a bit with the suitcases of cash, but you know the same concept, um, or having it in their homes and it's easily burglarized. 
Um, so these, I think that's just another piece of this to mention. Yes. Thank you so much for the talk. <clears throat> My name is Austin. Um, you brought up chain analysis and it reminded me of something really interesting that I read that I didn't quite know how to make sense of, so I thought I would kind of pose it to you. And it had to do with fungibility. So you can have, let's say, like a token or, or you can have a coin and exchange it one for one with somebody and how important that is for a monetary system. So one of the things I was wondering with chain analysis is if you can track that like a coin or, or and I apologize if I'm not using the terminology correctly, but if you can track that somebody used something for, let's say, something illegal, how does that affect the fungibility of it if somebody pays me with that and then I want to, like, let's say using chain analysis, maybe it's really easy, I can just log onto the internet and kind of type it in, then I can figure out, oh, this was used for something illegal, somebody might not want it now. So how does chain analysis kind of also interplay with the fungibility and how important that is for a currency? Sure. So I'll actually let Mary Beth take this one um, from her standpoint, and then I'll give my perspective as well. Thanks. Uh, you know, I, I think the thing to keep in mind here is that um, nobody wants to unwittingly be a participant in money laundering. And so that's why you would want to know whether the token has um, had any um, exposure to taint or whether it's come from a wallet associated with ransomware or, or money laundering. And particularly for money service businesses, you know, they have um, certain responsibilities under the law to um, prevent their businesses from being used for that purpose. So from your perspective, uh, just as an individual using, um, you know, an asset, you would probably want to know if, if you were continually getting an asset from the same source that continued to have some taint, then, then that would be something that you would want to be concerned about. Just like if the car dealer who uh, has someone come in every week and, and buy a, you know, $100,000 car, you know, they have to start wondering, hmm, you know, what, what's the source of those funds? But for the individual, um, you know, every, not every, but lots of digital assets moving around the space have been associated with some kind of taint, you know, up to this point. So I, I wouldn't uh, take that great leap and say that just because um, a, you know, token has been exposed at some point that it, it becomes, um, you know, not, non, uh, non-fungible. And we can also track how far back, like how far back was that exposure. And in most instances, companies even that have the responsibility to look for it, they will determine, all right, if it's this, you know, X hops back, you know, I, I don't need to, I don't need to be concerned about it. But they do want to know and, and they track it. And, and so um, I, I don't think that that prevents uh, digital assets from being uh, traded freely. And I would just like to reiterate some of the, you know, amongst all the blockchain analytics firms, you're looking at a very low percentage total of transactions that are being used for illicit behaviors. And so I think, you know, it's important to keep this in perspective. It is important to address. But I think that, you know, when we're looking at the amount um, of activity that's occurring, and we look at the percentage that would be identified as being associated with illicit behaviors. Even at like the highest estimates, it's like maybe 2%, but usually much less. And it's decreasing as the use of digital assets expands over time. Uh, unfortunately, we need to move on to the yeah. next the next speaker. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And we'll be at the FinTech reception this evening. So if there's further questions, we're happy to address them then. Thank you.